Now getting back to the core functionalities of the operating system, let's move over to scheduling. This is also discussing multiprocessing or processes and threads. So let's start with the concept of con concurrency. Many things are going on in an operating system. Applications, interrupts, background tasks, maintenance, and so forth. However, the CPU can only run one program at a time. So how are we going to do this? Well, the first solution is what we would call cyclic executive. So this is kind of a typical type of a cyclic executive type of a code. While true, do part of task one, then do part of task two, then do part of task three, then go and continue and continue. So it's an endless loop that switches between the tasks. Well, the problem is this is really hard to write. It's hard to maintain. It's hard to optimize. And what happens when an interrupt wants to come in? It can't handle that. And therefore, we go over to the second solution, which is known as the process abstraction. So we're going to decompose complex problems into simple ones, into programs. And then we're going to create an instance of a program, which we're going to call a process, and run it. A process is something that gets input, it runs, and then it provides output. That is a process. We're going to timeshare between the running processes through a, um, an operation that we call scheduling. And each process feels like it has the entire CPU. So we're going to um, timeshare between the processes. We're going to keep on loading different programs onto the CPU and run them as processes in their own time slot. So what are, is the difference, I guess, between a program and a process? A program is just the code. It's what we wrote over here, you know, some main with some foo, some bar. That's the program itself. It's a binary. It includes the text and the static data, as we saw in the memory map before, and it's completely passive. It's just a bunch of bytes that are on a disk. A process, on the other hand, is an instance of a program in execution. So it is a copy of this program code that sits in, you know, in the text uh, and static data areas. It's the processor state, which is the program counter, the registers, the memory, and it's the resources, file, uh, file pointers, and all kinds of other things like that. So a process is an instance of a running program. A program becomes a process when an executable is loaded into memory. So once we load the, pro the program into memory, it becomes a process. And we can have many processes um, that are running copies of the same program. So if we would take a look at, uh, you know, at a Windows uh, kind of process manager, we see that Chrome has a bunch of running processes. It can have you know, many more than the 13 that are shown here. But these are many processes of the same program, which is Google Chrome. However, there is only one set of resources. There's only one CPU. Of course, we have multi-core machines and so forth nowadays, but in just a kind of an abstract type of a old type looking at it, we only have one set of resources, one CPU or something like that. And therefore, we must schedule the processes onto these resources. And we also have to ensure that they're protected from each other so they don't um, do things that are harmful, such as writing over each other's data. So we need to provide an API for the processes. And how is a process created? So in POSIX systems, which we discussed before, the most common way to create a process is to do what we call a fork. So we have a parent process. The parent process calls this fork command. And what the fork command does is it creates a copy of the process, which is called the child process. And then the parent continues to run. And the child, which is a complete copy of it, just about, continues to run right next door to it. And why do we want to copy uh, the parent process? Well, actually, we don't really. Um, what we're going to do almost immediately, in most cases, after calling uh, a fork command and creating the child process, is we're going to um, run something called an exec command on the child process, which is going to basically write over the program, the, the static and text area of the memory map of the new process, with the new program that we want to execute. And then it's going to run its own new program. So this is something that was very strange to me. And I tried to look a lot uh, and find out what the answer is to why this is done. And uh, why would we want to just create a copy of a process and not just start a new process or something like that? And this is really a good question. I can't say that there is a completely good answer, but there is something that is called Lamson's Law. Um, and Lamson said, get it right. Okay, and uh, whatever, they made this API for, for POSIX, and it just works. So why not use it? There's a better answer than that. And it's because um, 
we want to run things uh, on a child process before executing it. Um, these are enabled by pipes and redirects in units and, in Unix and so forth. It also sets up some basic things in the process, in the new process, that we don't want to set up. So we basically create a copy of the parent process and then overwrite the uh, program itself with the exec command. So let's get to scheduling. A CPU can actually run only one process at a time. So how does the operating system know which process will be executing? When should it actually decide to change the current running process? And how can it efficiently utilize the resources that it has? So the decision of which tasks to run and when is what we call scheduling. A scheduling policy tries to optimize the performance and the fairness of all the processes that want to run on the limited resources that we have. So what are scheduling policies? The scheduling policy dictates which process will be run next. So that may depend on what we want to achieve. We want to maybe maximize throughput. Maybe we want to minimize the response time. Maybe we want to have fairness between the different processes that want to run. And there are a lot of different scheduling policies and a lot of research around this showing which one is best and how to use each one and so forth. There are things like first come, ser first serve, shortest job first, shortest remaining processing time first, round robin, and priority based scheduling. So these are kind of the main ones, but there are lots and lots of different types of scheduling policies and lots of research that has been done about them. The most common approach today that's used on different operating systems is what we call multi-level feedback queues, or MLFQ. And that provides several queues. Each queue has different priorities. And you usually apply something like round robin or some other type of policy within the queue itself. And also, we can move priorities, uh, move between the priority of the queues based on aging. So if a process sits too long in a low-level priority, and therefore it never gets scheduled, we can um, uh, rack it up so it's, uh, it, it goes to a higher priority, and then it gets scheduled earlier. So let's see how uh, queue-based preemptive scheduling works. Some policies feature queues, as we said before, of processes that are waiting to run. There's usually queues for each device, such as timers, interrupts, messages, and, and other types of things. So each, each of these processes has what we call an execution state within the queue. So the basic execution states that are usually commonly found are ready. So we start a process uh, over here, and it goes immediately into the ready state, which means it's waiting to be assigned to a CPU. So it could run, but right now there's another process that has the CPU, and therefore this process is just waiting is, is over there, and it's ready to be run. Um, once the uh, operating system decides to take that process and start running it, it will load it onto the CPU and then it goes into the running state. And in this case, um, this is the process that is now uh, controlling the CPU and using the resources. Um, at some point, the process could go into the waiting or block state, and that means it's waiting for an event. For example, let's say we had um, some sort of I.O. or something like that that takes a long time, so instead of taking up the resources and sticking the whole um, system while, while it's just waiting for that I.O. to respond, for example, it can go into the waiting queue, and then it's blocked, and then it will go back into the ready queue once that I.O. is complete or whatever it was waiting for finishes, whenever it gets a signal or something like that that it finished. So this is kind of the basic type of a thing, and the process continues running until it's terminated, and then we take it off of, the, of all the queues. So to complete this kind of a chart, we, um, the operating system can periodically decide to change which process is running. So it will ca uh, call an interrupt or something like that and will unschedule that process that's currently running and put it back on the ready queue and then it can dispatch or schedule a different type of process to be running. When it does this, this is called preemptive scheduling. So preempt from the dictionary means to acquire or appropriate before someone else. So according to the policy that the operating system has, it can go and before something else happens, not just waiting for or, you know, something to happen, it will go and preempt. It will decide, now I'm going to stop whatever is hogging my resources there, unschedule it, put it back on the ready queue, and take the next uh, highest priority thing that's ready to run and put it on the CPU. So that's called preemptive scheduling. And pretty much every operating system today uses some sort of scheduling policy, which is based on preemptive scheduling. So to do preemptive scheduling, we need a, a mechanism that is called a context switch. So what is context switching and what is a process control block? Context switching is the mechanism 
to change which process is currently running on the CPU. So if the policy that we showed before was a policy, what we plan on doing, the context switching is the mechanism to enable it to do it. What is it going to do? It's going to invoke the kernel. It's going to store the state of the running process. And then it can load the new process on the CPU and put the, cur uh, the previously running process on the ready queue. And it can reload it afterwards because it stored the state that it was running before. So what it needs is everything that's necessary for loading and storing a process. And, and that's in a data structure that is called the process control block. And what does this include? This includes things like the code for running the program, you know, the text area, the CPU registers like the program counter, the stack pointer, and all the, the general purpose registers that are important to save. Um, the address space, so whatever we had in the static data, the stack, the heap, the different page tables, and so forth, that's all part of the process control block. And the I.O. status, things like open files or I.O. devices that are allocated to the process. So all of those belong to the process, and they're stored inside this data structure that we call a PCP or a process control block. What else? We have additional information that is used by the operating system. We have the process identification, that's the PID, each process has its own PID. We have the execution state of the process, as we saw before, ready, running, waiting, etc. Scheduling information, what type of priorities it has, queue pointers, and so forth, and different type of accounting data, like uh, how much of the CPU it used, what the running time was, and so forth, for aging, and so forth, and so on. So the PCB has both everything we had in the memory map and the registers, and it has a whole bunch of other type of metadata that we want to store. So the PCB is a quite a large type of a uh, data structure that we need to store and load every time we context switch. So let's go back to the Tiemann analogy and see what context switching is. Because after learning about this concept of uh, concept uh, context switching, I figured out that it's pretty much what happens every moment of my life. OK, so I need to prepare this lecture. This has been happening with me for the last few months. So I open up PowerPoint, and I start working on the slides. And humdi dum, I'm enjoying you know, making these slides and these cool animations. All of a sudden, I get a WhatsApp message. Yeah, it's my wife. She's at the store. Do I need anything? Well, got to save my work, go to the kitchen, look around, check if there's anything I need. OK, finished. Now I go back to work. And where was I? What was I exactly looking at? What did I have open and so forth? Uh, OK, continue back to work. Ah. Phone rings, ring. Oh, it's Alex. Alex, if you don't know, he's my, uh, you know, kind of partner in crime over here. And he calls me up all the time and he says something like is really important that has to happen. I need to send that email and I need to do it now or else, you know, the world's going to blow up. So I go save my work. I open up my, you know, my Gmail and I send my email. Okay. Well, now I can reopen PowerPoint, continue editing. Where was I? I have to get back to it, you know reload my PCB back into my brain and, and continue working. Ah, the alarm clock rings. Guess what? Time to pick up the kids from school and so forth. Well, I'm going to save work, put my computer to sleep, and go and find my car keys, which are stuck underneath the couch. So that brings us to what we call the thread. So processes, they don't share resources well. First of all, as we saw before, context switching is a real expensive thing. We have to save and restore that whole PCB. This could include page tables and really big data structures, which are very costly to go in context switch. So if we do it every many, many, you know, millions of cycles or whatever, then fine, we can, uh, you know, uh, we can uh, make that negligible. But really, it is an overhead that we don't want to do that much. Um, sharing between pro uh, sharing data between processes is really complicated, right? We have different uh, memory maps between them, and how are we going to actually do the sharing? Actually, we're going to be discussing that in the next section. So, what is the idea here? Let's separate concurrency, which is running, you know, multiple things on the same amount and the same resources from protection, from uh, creating this protection between processes so they think that they have the complete and entire, um, you know, uh, uh, resources. They have the whole memory map entirely to themselves. And how are we going to do this? We're going to create a lightweight process. A lightweight process is better known as a thread. Now, just mind you that there are often a lot of, uh, you know, misuse of the terminology. Sometimes people call a process a thread, a thread a process. They can call both of them a, st a task. This can actually be in the official nomenclature of different types of systems, such as uh, types of uh, um, uh, real-time operating systems and so forth. But the actual uh, basic um, uh, definition of a thread is a lightweight process. So a process can have several threads. 
several lightweight processes. So let's look at a process. A process has a single uh, address space. So we saw before, you know, that we have a memory map like this. It has something like the code uh, segment and the text segment that has the program stored in it, the static data where we have our globals and our static variables and so forth. Then we have the stack that usually um, grows from top to bottom and the heap that grows from the other side um, that are uh, th that is... Uh, creating our you know memory area and then we have all kinds of resources such as open files signals different things like that a thread is uh, uses the same type of basic area as the um, as the process does so it doesn't get its own memory allocated to it on the other hand what it does get it gets its own uh, program counter so as we can see each thread has a program counter that's pointing to somewhere in the same code that they, all the threads shared it gets its CPU registers so each one of them um, needs to know what its state is and that's through the CPU registers and each one of them gets a stack so each one of them has a stack pointer where it's building you know its own stack um, now pay attention that there's no protection between the threads because all of this is in the same pro uh, the same uh, memory map uh, or memory space that was allocated to one process. So um, the code can actually go to any of the, the stacks of the, different, uh, of the different threads over here. And so there's no protection between them. And what that means is that we can easily share data between these things, but we have to be really careful because um, if our code is not written carefully, it can actually do things that we don't want to do. But considering they're all using the same code base, the same developer developed this code base, so that's a, that enables us to really um, uh, maintain this protection without uh, having uh, real protection mechanisms inside. Um, now, of course, uh, that, that enables us to do things like context switch much er easier because all we need to do really is change our, CP, our PC and our CPU registers and change um, the place that our uh, stack pointer is pointing. So threads are concurrent executions that share a same address space and they share some same um, OS resources. So looking at it graphically, this is kind of a picture that operating systems people like to, they like to show these threads as these kind of squiggles, um, something, some program that is running over here. And a regular th single threaded process over here has one thread, one, you know, program flow, one um, program counter that is running through this. And it has its code, its data, and its files, and it has its registers and its stack. Once we go to a multi-threaded process, well, the code, data, and files are still shared between all of the threads, but each one of these threads has its own registers and stack, and therefore we can just um, context switch between them by just reloading the registers and stack. So threads are obviously cheaper than processes. Creating a thread is cheap, context switching between threads is cheap, and sharing data between threads is cheap. And so in a multiple threaded task, while one thread is blocked and waiting, a, a second thread in the same process can run. So for example, if one of the threads wants to go out to IO or something, we don't have to put the, uh, the whole process onto, back onto the queue and wait until it's scheduled uh, again. We can just context switch to a different thread. The other thread can continue running while this one is waiting for IO. So if we got a time slot in whatever type of uh, scheduling policy we had that was long enough, then um, this thread, you know, can go to go go to sleep, and this thread can be scheduled um, while it's waiting for its I/O instead of going in waiting for all the processes that are in the in in the uh, entire system that are waiting to run. So this provides us with higher throughput and improved performance. So really, multi-threading is the way things are done nowadays. So a last kind of note about that, and again, I'm not going very deep into this. This is uh, there's a lot, lot, lot. Uh, about multi-threading, but there is this concept of kernel versus user-level threads. So the question is, how are threads managed? How are they created? Who allocates memory for them? And how are they context switched between them? So a basic kind of concept could be what we call a kernel thread, and this is sometimes used, where the OS completely manages the threads. So all, this all these decisions about scheduling the threads and about accessing I.O. and everything, they're done through the, the kernel. So each thread has a kernel thread that's associated with it. So each of the the threads that's running inside the process has its own kernel thread over here and therefore all the thread operations are implemented within the kernel whenever the, this thread wants to do something it has to do a system call go to its kernel thread and ask to do whatever it wants to do um, thread operations are still cheaper than process ones but they are costly because they have to do these uh, frequent con uh, frequent system calls 
Uh, alternatively, a process can, it can manage its threads in user space. So this is a different type of a way of doing it, and these are called user level threads. So in this case, we have, you know, uh, the, the process itself has code that's doing the context switching between the threads, that's doing the scheduling between the threads. So every time a thread wants to switch and so forth, it doesn't have to go all the way to the kernel to ask to do it. The process itself does it. And therefore, we, it becomes much cheaper to manage. It can be 10 to 100 times faster. Um, but it can be limited due to I.O. operations during, going through the OS. So every time a thread wants to access something that needs uh, you know, special permissions, it needs to go through the, the, the main kernel. Um, another concept that I just want to mention over here, and I haven't talked about it at all within this course, but it's very interesting to, to hardware designers, is what we call hardware threads or hearts. And they provide very efficient context switching. So in that case, we'll have actual hardware um, that enables us to do context switching really cheaply. For example, we'll have several sets of registers so we can just change which registers are the registers that we're accessing instead of storing the registers on the stack and reloading them during a context switch. So many of the CPUs nowadays have at least two of these hardware threads. Um, and that enables us to do what is called simultaneous multi-threading or SMT. And Intel has been calling this hyper-threading for several years since they, um, since they introduced it. And so in this case, we have actual hardware support for context switching only between you know, a, a, a small number of threads, something like two. But there we, there we can do really cheap and really fast context switching without actually going and saving the whole PCB and loading it again as, uh, as was done before or, um, or saving all the registers and loading them again. Uh, which we would have to do, you know, in a type of a user level thread type of a thing. So that's all about uh, multiprocessing, about scheduling, about processes, and about threads.